we've worked through the factors that, that, that um, affect the stratigraphic sequence. The nature of the sediments, the layers, um, the interfaces, the features that cut across all of these, the post-depositional factors that overprint the stratigraphic sequence. Let's go back to our archaeologists sitting in a trench staring at a wall of red-brown undifferentiated sediment. What do you do? Of course, it, yes, it is useful to record colour, texture and pH, but do this towards an end. Now, have a look at how the texture of the sediments varies either across the sequence or, or up the profile. Try and work out whether they, there really are any uh, changes here. Uh, you may have a completely uniform sediment, but texture is the best guide, I think, not colour. Look at the rocks. As, as, as I stressed before, rocks are an opportunity. How are the rocks sitting in a deposit? If they're rocks that have a flat surface, how, how is that oriented? Um, that'll give you a, a, a guide to the slope of the deposit and the grain of the deposit. Have a bit of a, an eye to the relationship between the rock shelter sediments and the exterior sediments. You know, are they continuous? Could they be continuous? Are the rock shelter sediments perched on a hillside somewhere? Um, what are the layer boundaries like, uh, if you can see any boundaries at all? Um, be careful how you draw boundaries. Use solid lines for sharp interfaces. Use dotted lines for gradual changes. Don't make all the lines on your stratigraphic drawing the same. Don't draw a line around mottled areas as if it was a bounded layer. If you're outlining organic um, uh, concentrations, charcoal smudges, you have to try and work out what you're looking at and annotate your drawing. Are you looking at a, a hearth, a, di a diffuse hearth, or just an area of charcoal enrichment, or maybe a tree root? Have an eye to the preservation of features. Features are preserved more commonly than, uh, than we, 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 we often allow. I mean, many small rock shelter sites have a whole series of hearths. Well, have a look at them, how well are they preserved. The fact that they're preserved suggests there's been minimal post-depositional alteration of the sediment. Look at how the hearths are laying. They've been laid down on the surface as well. Try and work out what layer they've been dug from if they're a, a pit type uh, feature. Overall, I'm arguing that you should hazard an interpretation of a site. Try and look at the biography or the sedimentary history of the site. Try your hand at listing the sequence of events in, in, in temporal order. What was laid down? How was it laid down? Where did it go? What's happened to it since? What happened to it before the next layer was laid on top? And so forth. You can use laboratory analyses to supplement and test field interpretations, but don't use them as a primary means of understanding the stratigraphic structure. You can do this as a field archaeologist. It's conceptual, not technical. Yes, of course, the sort of analyses you can use, though, to, to supplement your field interpretations are grain size analysis of, of the sediments, because of course that is very useful in working out what sort of sediments you're looking at or whether you've got a mixture of sediments. Use thin sections if you, if you can get them to, to look at the fabric of your sediment to, to perhaps see whether, uh, uh, whether you've got uh, palatal clays or whether the voids are filled with clay and, and how the minerals are uh, aligned within the sediments. Mineralogy is good but in many cases it's not going to tell you very much in, in uh, many Australian sites. Global um, diagrams, which, which juxtapose um, particle size analysis with, with, with other stratigraphic, stratigraphic information, are very useful for getting an overall sense of the change in a deposit. OK, this is a global diagram from Prudjara Rock Shelter. It shows the proportion, change in proportion of coarse rocks and, and, and gravel and the fine sediments in terms of sand, silt and clay, and also the proportion of, of grass in the phytolith column. And what it shows is on a global diagram like this, you can see a whole series of related changes between layers 1 and 2 at about 8,000 years ago. The, uh, the uh, size of the, the rocks change, you get a lot more fine gravel, you get a lot less uh, large rock fall, uh, you get a change to a much more sandy deposit, and a, a great increase in the proportion of grass. So you've got a whole range of changes here that relate to the changing local environment of the rock shelter. But it's the ability to compare across uh, these different materials that makes these diagrams useful. And so at Purit for instance, 
uh, originally in the Pleistocene layers, uh, we had mainly large block form, and the fine sediments were, cons were made up of uh, primarily um, windborne material that was deflating from dune crests and interdunal corridors. Uh, but as those areas revegetated during the Holocene and you got uh, a more moist, aggressive weathering regime within the rock shelter, the deposits switched over to a more gritty and less rocky deposit and uh, the supply of clay-rich sand cut off and left us with much more just sand from sand from dune crests. And you can see that happening just when you look at the coarse component, the rocks and the gravel as well as the fine sediments. Uh, magnetics, magnetic stratigraphy is a, a promising way to, to, to go, but as I, I suggest, uh, as I stress, most of, of what we've covered today, a good field archaeologist can do with just a trowel and a pH kit and a magnifying glass. Chronostratigraphy, of course, when you get your dates back, there may be a few surprises. Yeah. Samples that are separated by only a few centimetres might be thousands of years difference in age. Um, I think you should try and minimise the potential for such surprises by working out what you've got in the field. There is a real danger here of drawing stratigraphic boundaries after the event, a sort of painting, painting by numbers approach, which, which I think is a bit dodgy. This is one of the stratigraphic drawings for Purujara Rock Shelter in Western Central Australia. It shows a number of things. First of all, uh, only use um, sharp lines where you've got a very sharp boundary. Uh, the boundary between these two layers is uh, um, a graded boundary over a few centimetres change between the silty clays and the, and the sands of the Holocene units. It also shows some of the uh, stratigraphic features. We have this pit here, dug, and if you look carefully you can see it's dug from this level here, as indicated by the line of material. Uh, very important to isolate these features. If any of these TL samples had come through that feature, they would have given us a, a false age for the sediment. And then um, the other feature I want to draw your attention to here is this little fire pit feature shown here and also shown here and here, various cuts through it. What it shows is a, uh, a feature that has been um, a pit that's been dug um, fairly quickly, uh, uh, fast burning fuel has been lit in it which leaves a, a cinder of a burnt mass and soots the, 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 the margin of the pit and here you can see it in the longitudinal section with the burnt uh, cinder. It's a little fire pit probably used for, for heating sappy wood or something like that as you're shaping it. It's a very ephemeral feature but again could cause chaos if you, if we, if you don't isolate these during excavation. And of course they also have a spatial component and a care towards the front of the rock shoulder. Overall, I think what, what we're aiming for in a stratigraphic uh, diagram is not so much a straight um, recording of what we can see, but a, but a good field interpretation. One has simply got to sit down with the section and work out what you've got and where it's coming from and how it's laid down and have a stab at doing this. I mean, description alone is inadequate and is usually confused rather than objective. And uh, if you can't work out what you've got in the field, quite likely no one else can work out what you've got from looking at your stratigraphic plan. So the art of stratigraphy, it is an art, but it's not a difficult art, and it just requires you to ask some questions about the nature of your site and how it's built up. And this will help you both uh, understand um, uh, the structure of your site and the deposits it contains will also help guide your hand for future excavation because excavation is effectively a dissection of structure. Mike, when you began the, your discussion of stratigraphy, you said in a sense it was like surgery. Yes. Um, and it's interesting, I was watching a program on surgery not long ago mm. and a surgeon was teaching younger surgeons mm. and he opened a person up on television mm. and when he looked in he said no one can tell any of the organs in the body when they look in he said get your hands in and feel it just touch it mm. feel it and feel the differences between the organs mm. and close your eyes and feel it do you think 
archaeologists need to get into a trench and and, uh, and this is how I do it. I often tell the difference between sediments by just getting some of my fingers and rubbing it and mm. feeling it and getting it uh, before I decide what something is. I can often do it just by the feel of it and I guess uh, is that something archaeologists should do? Should they have a, I guess, an apprenticeship in the field? I think, uh, I mean, it's definitely a case for a, a field apprenticeship, but I think you can learn a lot of this material by uh, working through uh, other people's stratigraphic diagrams and trying to sketch out the order of events in how a deposit is built up. At least that will alert you to the sort of problems and questions. But, like you, I work my way up a, up a section by feeling it. I think texture and fabric is much more important than colour. Colour, colour is misleading. Um, uh, you feel, feel a section, you feel where there are real changes in, uh, in uh, uh, the grade of the sediment. You go back to your field notes and you see where the proportion of gravel and grit is changing. You can then also go later on to your particle size analysis in a lab, just the, the, the sieving of your sand fraction and work out where the, whether those boundaries uh, you know, agree with what you've identified in the field. I mean what I like to do is, is um, collect a column uh, sample, a whole set of samples down a stratigraphic sequence and uh, in the field I've maybe perhaps identified a, a shift to more clay rich sediments at point X. Well then I'll go and test that in the laboratory and see if that's where I get a change in particle size and use the laboratory analysis to back up my field work, my field observations. I mean, uh, I mean, excavation is a very tactile process. I mean, you, you, you've got to have a real sense of how things are bedded, you know, as you flip them up when you're excavating. And I think with features too, um, you, can, um, you can tap sediments and watch things fall away from the edge of a pit. Um, uh, you, 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 you've got to, you've got to, You've got to use a range of techniques to expose that structure. I think there's a, the, the final point here which, which would, would, would lead us into a wider discussion of how we work with uh, archaeological assemblages is simply that um, we've got to dig enough of a site to be able to characterise uh, uh, both the nature of the occupation and the actual history of the site in terms of the formation of the sediment. We often can't do this from just a one square metre pit. We can have a go, but uh, uh, really we have this wealth of plus in sites in Australia, but, but few of them have been adequately characterised in terms of the, the nature of the deposit or in terms of the nature of the occupation. And we really need to do more if we're going to exploit the potential of these as environmental and cultural archives.